Hey, uh, have you had enough testing? Never, never enough testing. We've been doing a lot of uh, testing, so better get started now to like it. Um, today, uh, I will uh, I will teach you uh, a few tricks for how to design code that's more and more testable. It ties in very tightly with the last lecture that we did on doubles, uh, but it goes beyond that. How do you even I mean, you write these doubles? How do you change your code? How do you even design your code uh, to plug in the doubles? And uh, the essence of what we're going to learn is this uh, dependency injection, which is a, is a fairly fashionable uh, technique uh, nowadays. And there are frameworks that are coming up. Um, and as usual, I want to uh, put a plug for these two references that I really like, that you, I think you should, be, uh, you should be checking out. So. Uh, there's going to be some uh, some review from last time, and then I'll ask some questions which should be very easy to answer because you uh, you still remember what we did on Monday, did you? Uh, or do you? The terminology. We have the system under test, and everything else in terms of code that it needs uh, to run, uh, so that we can we can test it. And again, if the system under test is a simple method then it may need, you may need a constructor to even construct the object before you can invoke the method. Or your system on the test might invoke some other helper methods. Those become this uh, dependent on component. Uh, if you're doing bigger tests, then you likely have more dependent on components. Constructors, maybe more than one, or several classes, if you need several classes, and other helper methods. And so the bigger, the bigger this uh, unit uh, that you're testing, probably the more things it uh, depends on. And we have discussed that this is actually a problem. You'd want uh, very much to kind of test this as with as few other moving parts as possible, such that when a test uh, fails, you know it fails because of a bug in the code that you're actually testing and not because of everything else uh, around it. Uh, if you do this well, even if you're building a huge system, every individual test will be actually will exercise a little part of the system. So it's going to be quite manageable. Um, without this, um, many tests will end up being really too heavy to run uh, uh, very often and too heavy to even uh, to even debug. Uh, this, is, this is actually very important in case I haven't convinced you already. Uh, imagine when we have a 1,000 tests, which is quite reasonable for even a small team, and they start to fail. Uh, if the test is a unit test. It only runs the method that I wrote. I'm probably the owner of the test. I get email. I know where the bug is. I know I should be fixing it because it's mine. If I know that this is a test that involves everybody else's code, um, uh, it's not clear. Uh, first, I'm even scared to even try looking at it, why it failed, because who knows where it failed. And second, it's not clear who uh, is in the best position to fix the test. Okay? The bigger the test, the bigger the problems of all sorts. Um, okay, so uh, this we, we did this last time. Um, so the depending on components is just extra moving parts. You don't want that. Uh, it may even be expensive, uh, expensive to uh, set up. And if you don't do it properly, don't set it up properly, don't tear it down properly, then your other tests that depend on the same components uh, will interfere, will start failing. A database is a very classic example of this. And uh, nowadays, in fact. If you're using frameworks like Rails and Django to work with a database, those frameworks abstract the database so well from you that they even are able to provide testing support to, uh, to take care of this part, like tearing down and setting up so that there's no interference. But it still uh, can be slow. So a bug in the dependent on component can actually lead to test failure, and it's very confusing. Um, and tests may be, may be slow. Remember the example that we finished with uh, last time. Uh, it's uh, the system that monitors uh, temperature changes over time and triggers alerts. Uh, so the system was, uh, okay, no. uh, this was a structure of the system. Uh, there was a temperature provider that somehow reads the current temperature. Uh, there was a time provider that's two things. You can get the current time and uh, it runs an internal timer and different parts of the system can plug into the timer by registering the callback to be called on every timer uh, firing. And, uh, and then there's an alerter that sends the actual alert, an SMS or an email. And then maybe most of the complexity 
then is in here, is in this on tick method or some other helper methods in main, which will put together the temperature, the time, the history of the temperature over time, and decide, I'll use some business logic, and decide I want to fire the alert. So in some sense, this is where you're going to have most of the complexity of the code and most of the changes probably over time. Uh, this is what you want to test, but it depends on so many other things, depending on components. Uh, the alert provider, the temperature provider, the time provider. Uh, do you remember what we said are difficulties in, in testing this? So first test refresh button on your memory. I should come by. It'd be hard to get um, all the right temperatures to test. Right, it's hard to simulate uh, extreme temperatures. Something else? Just for the whole system. Say it again? For the whole system? Yes. Well, I mean, they rely on a lot of inputs that don't occur. Um, so this wasn't one example. Any more concrete examples, like the temper extreme temperature provider? What, what? Give me another example of an input. Uh, for, for, for example, the alert provider, right? You don't want to send actual alerts. Right, you don't want to send actual alerts. I have more people hands up. Uh, let's, uh, somebody there. Uh, more. Yeah, time, uh, if you have long timeouts in your business logic, I mean, you don't want the test to take uh, an hour or you know, a month, whatever it is. Um, time takes time, what else? Um, okay, but even that is already enough reasons to try to do something better uh, than testing it as is. Um, yeah, you might not even have the temperature sensors, test, uh, you know, time takes time, uh, exceptional situations, temperature readings, uh, strange time um, moments, and uh, the tests are not reproducible, that's another one. If you're really plugging in into the physical world, it's very hard to uh, reproduce the tests. And you don't want to be able to write tests that are reproducible, because uh, if the test fails, uh, you should be able to rerun the test in the debugger several times with different breakpoints to just narrow down what the cause is. Uh, if you're plugged in into actual temperature sensor, you're never going to be able to reproduce. So what we did in, uh, at the end of last lecture, I showed you examples of how you'd write fake implementations of uh, the temperature provider, the timer provider, and we didn't do one for the alert provider, but that would be a trivial, um, you know, a fake alert provider just sets a global variable that an alert has been fired or, um, and so on. So the temperature provider, um, there was a simple one that uh, was able to simulate linear changes of temperature over time with a threshold, with a bound. Okay, that's all you knew how to do, and presumably you can write a lot of tests with that. Um, the time provider uh, did, had two uh, features. One was uh, it was able to simulate any time interval in the past or in the future, uh, simply by setting the fake time in it. And the second, uh, and this was really very cool, I think, uh, it was actually speeding up time because all of the system has the same notion of time coming from this fake time provider. It can essentially just uh, increment it faster than the real time, and nobody could tell. None of the other parts of the system could tell. And this is uh, it's quite impressive when you do this for the first time, and it's not even hard to do if you have a time-driven system uh, to see your tests suddenly, you know, a minute squished to a second. And, go very fast and um, all reproducible. The, what we didn't talk was how to actually design the code so that you can easily inject these fakes. Okay? Maybe for, the, for this example, code base, it wasn't so hard. Uh, but let's look at it, how, how it's done. And the technique that we're going to be uh, using is called dependency injection. Any, any questions so far? It was mostly a review. No? Questions? Good. So, how would you write the code if you don't think about testing? Um, you would uh, write this class main, and this is the on tick uh, method in main, which is triggered once a uh, timer tick, maybe once a second. And uh, as I said, this is probably where you put most of your complexity of your code. And it's going to be a mix of complex calculations and interaction with your with your sensors. Probably you will uh, you'll call your time provider to get the time, 
you will have some complex logic that decides uh, whether or not to read the temperature sensors. And you will actually uh, probably do something like this, access your MyTemp instance of the temperature provider and get the temperature. And then, uh, depending on how complex your logic to alert is, you might have to do the sum calculation, sliding window averages of temperature changes over time, speeds, rates of change, all that stuff uh, that for sure will have bugs. Um, and then at the end, perhaps you compute one of these uh, bad variables, and if bad, you actually send the alert or do something else, okay? Or update the state, maybe for the next firing of the time. Clear? Um, so everything is all in one uh, basket there, the on tick. This is a better way uh, to write it. And what I'm doing is simply a refactoring technique. Um, although this is not one that an ID will do for you automatically with the button click, but it's one that you can do conceptually. I'm going to take this on tick method and separate it into two parts. Um, Let's look at the bottom one first, with what's left of the untick. I'm going to keep in here uh, the, the sequence of, uh, of the operations that I'm going to do, but none of the complex calculations, none of the complexity of the code is here. This should be almost straight line code, uh, ideally with no conditionals, ideally with no loops. Uh, very little opportunity to have bugs in here. Okay, so uh, I know that I will need to get the time and the temperature, so I get those once, as opposed to uh, in the previous code maybe doing that in some deep conditionals and loops and such. Uh, and then I'm gonna hoist out all of the complex logic that reads the current time, the current temperature, and perhaps um, it has a state of previous such readings, and this will return an alert, and if alert, I, uh, I send the alerter. And I move here, in this method, all the complexity from before. Now, this method does not have implicit dependencies on the time provider and temperature provider. The time is passed in here, the temperature is passed in here. It should not need to access your dependent components anymore. Uh, it should compute with those values. So whenever it needs a temperature, it just uses this variable, uh, the parameter. And uh, it it doesn't alert by itself. It just returns the signal, a Boolean maybe, or a, a, a text with, um, with um, reason for the alert, okay? The advantage is that this code has no dependencies. Uh, it gets in data, does complex calculation, returns a result. This is easy to test. This is what you can test with unit tests. Uh, and you can plug in very complex, you know, time and temperatures uh, and histories and all that to test various scenarios. So what this is called in, uh, in this kind of, uh, the terminology for this, is this is the smart code. This is where the smarts of your code are. And uh, typically smart code is where the bugs are. Uh, and it's the code that you want to test happen. What's left, this is called the humble so this is just common terminology for, uh, for testing and refactoring. Humble is, you know, you could call it stupid code, but stupid is not such a nice word, so humble. Uh, and it's interesting to look at this code. What is in here? Very little logic, little opportunity for mistake. Uh, put here most of the interaction with the external world, okay? It's hard to test because it needs the external world. But it's not worth testing. It's not as worth testing as this, right? There's very little opportunity for error here. Most is going to be here. Most of the maintenance of your code is going to be here. Uh, most of the bugs that you'll be introducing in the future are there. So you kind of uh, take a, a big ensemble that's hard to test because it interacts with external world that has lots of complexity and bugs. Separate out the complexity without the interaction. Keep uh, little complexity and interaction in one part, um, and maybe you won't write so many tests. Maybe you'll write one test for this, uh, but most of your unit tests are going to be for this. Any questions about this? No? Mm -hmm. um, okay, but 
So that's something you should try to do as much as possible. Uh, it's not always possible to separate out the computation from the interaction with your dependent on component. What do you do when you can't do that? Well, let's consider a case um, where you have this uh, init method. This is, this is the constructor of, uh, of main. Okay? The constructors are very important pieces of code because you cannot test a method without first constructing an object called the method object, right? So uh, the constructor is almost always a, a dependency for most of your tests. So we're gonna look at how, what can you do with the constructor? So this constructor is not so good. Uh, for one thing, it, uh, even before you can call the constructor, you need to pass this parameter that let's say it's something that's expensive to obtain. Maybe it's a connection uh, to a Google API or the connection to a MySQL database. And that takes uh, time uh, to get. You might even have a limited number of those available. So uh, that's even before you call the constructor. Once you call the constructor, let's say that the constructor sets up the dependencies. Okay. Um, and these dependencies might have their own dependencies in terms, right? So then this constructor has its own dependencies. Even worse, and um, even worse, in the constructor, you start doing work. Specifically, you start doing work with these dependencies. Uh, you actually use this expensive to get uh, object that you got in there. You actually use the time provider, you use the alerter, uh, probably to send even an alert. This is a problem because uh, you want to test a simple method in this class main. To test that, you have to call this constructor. Not only do you have to construct its parameters, but the constructor, before you have a chance of doing anything, it just sends alerts, it does stuff, uh, too much. Too much stuff. So what do you think we're gonna do? to address this problem. The constructor does too much. What is it? Why does it do too much? Well, for not a good reason, but what do you do? Did you write constructors like this? Because I did. Um, it's tempting say, okay, uh, it's a very nice way to put, uh, to initialize everything when you construct such that after the constructor you know that the world is in a uh, happy state. It's hard to test things like that. For, for example, if one of the later functions that you call breaks, then you don't know which part of it in the constructor breaks. Right, so it's hard to test, and what do you do to address this? Split it. Take it out. You split it. Okay, that's that's what I was looking for. Um, but actually, uh, and that's going to be on the next slide. Uh, the first thing that you can try to do is say, well, well maybe I don't need the constructor. Uh, I'm trying to test this method. This constructor does a lot of stuff. Uh, perhaps the method uh, can be a static method. Okay, if you take a method, uh, how do you recognize a method that can be a static method? Well, uh, I'm saying take a method, and I'm, say, uh, I'm um, asking you to figure out if you can easily change it into a static method. I saw that what you did <laughs> to figure out the answer. Uh, somebody else? You need an object uh, that, that, like, that encompasses the method that, that reads the method. Right. So uh, look at the body of the method. Does it really use the object, the instance fields? If it doesn't, maybe it deserves to be a static method. A static method has fewer dependencies. It doesn't depend on the constructor. Even if you have a complex constructor, you can test it uh, without calling the constructor. Okay? So um, try to use static methods if, if it's possible. Um, but in general, in general, you won't be able to do that. So you really have to face that ugly constructor from before. And what they're going to do is, uh, as somebody said, we're going to split it up. Uh, we're going to split up 
the actual construction, and the construction should mostly set things up without doing work with those things. Okay? You should have a separate, maybe start method, maybe uh, you know, uh, run or whatever uh, way you want to name it, but essentially you're splitting up the construction of the object, which is setting up the references from the actual initialization. Okay? So move all the active code out of the constructor. Um, so this has an advantage that uh, maybe then you don't need that hard to uh, or expensive to get thing uh, because that's only needed in, in this part. Uh, so it's easier to call the constructor. And the other advantage that we'll have is uh, that we're left behind with a constructor that is humble. It's simple. There's no active code in it, just no straight line code. It has the dependencies indeed, but maybe uh, we don't need to uh, we don't need to deal um, we, we can actually uh, do something with those dependencies um, that for example replace them with fakes or even null pointers because they're not being used in the constructor right so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to find ways to replace this dependency but the, the point I'm trying to make here is that even if this constructor constructs the actual time provider, because it doesn't use it, uh, we have a chance later to replace that time provider with a fake time provider. If it starts using the time provider, it's too late um, to replace it. Okay, so uh, remember when we introduced doubles, uh, doubles are replacement uh, for the dependent on component, for our dependencies that resemble the dependent on component up to a certain point. And that, how much resemblance you have, that depends very much on your test. But very often, uh, if you know what to look for, you're going to find opportunities to write doubles that are significantly simpler and faster than the dependencies they, uh, they replace. OK, so uh, if you use doubles, the way your test runs essentially, uh, or the test is, uh, is put together, first you have to construct the doubles and configure them. Remember we had those uh, uh, configurable doubles that you kind of set in uh, beforehand with the replies they should give when they're being used? The test stubs, okay, and uh, the mocks. Then you set up your, uh, your uh, SUT and somehow between setting up the SUT and actually running it, you have to inject in the SUT the doubles in place of the actual dependencies, such that when SUT runs, it uses your doubles instead of the actual time provider and temperature provider. And then you run the SUT, and you verify the state, and then some doubles have their own state. Remember mocks, where we can ask the, the double, OK, were you called three times? Uh, Let's fail the test if you weren't, and so on. So what we're going to look at now, so last lecture we looked at how we constructed the doubles. In previous lectures we looked at you know, this part. And uh, this is the, the injection that we're going to be considering now. And this is dependency injection technique number one. Uh, you essentially pass the dependent on components as parameters. So this, it, this is a design recipe. You design your code to pass the dependencies as parameters. So instead of writing the constructor for main to refer to the actual dependencies, time provider, temperature provider, you pass them in as parameters. So essentially you push the responsibility to your caller to instantiate uh, these dependencies. Okay? You just store them and then the rest of the code operates as um, as usual. Uh, you may want, for convenience, to have a, a separate constructor that has the same exact functionality as the one from before, meaning uh, it takes no parameters, it constructs a time provider, temperature provider, alert provider, and then calls this constructor. Okay? So this constructor has the same functionality from before, but you also have this constructor, which will give you more power in, uh, in testing. Is this clear?
Okay? Well then, let me ask you, how do you think I'm going to use this construct? In what way this construct will give me more power than the one before, than this one for testing? Okay, uh, somebody else? It's the right answer, but hopefully they haven't heard it. Doubles. What? Doubles. What doubles? You can pass in doubles. I can pass in the doubles. Okay, good. Um, indeed, that's, that's exactly where I'm going at. So let me show you. Uh, this is how we write the test with it. Um, first, I construct my doubles. I configure them. Remember the temperature double had this uh, uh, way to configure where I pass in the start temperature, the step, how much it should increase every time, and the, uh, the upper bound where it should stop increasing. And then I construct my SUT by injecting the dependencies passing in the phase. Okay? So I'm constructing my system under test and telling it to use the, this one for the time provider, for the temperature provider, alert provider. And it will actually be using my fakes. It won't be using the actual one. So I'm doing injection of dependencies by way of, of parameters. Uh, but to do this, you have to write your code for testing, for dependency injection. And the rest is, uh, is as before. There's nothing, nothing you know, new from before. Okay? I suspect this was uh, clear. Oh. Uh, let's get into more complicated things. Um, so in some languages, um, like in Python, for example, or even in, in Java sometimes, you can, uh, you can actually do better, uh, do, do it differently. So you leave the constructor as it was before. But the important part is you, you let the constructor construct your actual collaborators but don't use them. Just uh, is create some objects, okay? And these objects, recursively, their constructors should not do any work. They should just construct that object. Um, and, uh, and the rest of the code is as before. The trick that we're gonna exploit is, we're gonna call this constructor, which constructs the actual collaborators, but before we start it, we're gonna go and replace these, okay? So if your collaborators are exposed through uh, some accessible field variables, or if there are setters for that, then, uh, then we can write this like this. We construct the SUT, and this will construct its collaborators, but won't use them. And then we'll just stick in uh, our, uh, our collaborators. Now, this is not always possible because uh, this would require, in a language like Java, to have these collaborators exposed in fields that are public. Okay? So that's not always a, a good design. Uh, sometimes people write setters, which are clearly commented that this setter is only used for testing. Uh, okay? And the rest of the code is as, uh, is as before. We achieve the same thing, essentially. We're replacing the, the collaborators. So that's, that's one possibility. Um, it's called, this is called a setter injection. Uh, let me show you a third possibility. And this one you would use when uh, the collaborators are constructed uh, somewhere in, in complex logic deep inside. Uh, maybe you have an array of them. Who knows uh, how they are constructed. Okay? So it's not so easy to pass them through arguments. So imagine, uh, imagine that your um, Um, imagine that you don't construct the collaborators in the constructor of main, but inside this complex code, um, I have this dot, dot, dot here to suggest that this is somewhere deep inside. What you can do is you can replace an occurrence of a new time provider with a lookup service. So a lookup service is a, uh, either a factory or a singleton service. It's a class whose job is to create instances of time providers, or temperature providers, and alert providers. Okay. Again, you would do this in your production code. Uh, 
Once you have this, what do you think we can do? How is this going to help with testing? Okay, uh, so what I'm guessing you're saying is that uh, we're going to configure this time provider service to return a fade next time the get instance is called. Okay? I'm not sure whether you understand why this is, uh, when this would be uh, important. Do you? You want me to explain again? I saw at least one person. Previous example, um, the previous example only works when you know that this guy has three collaborators and they are in these variables. Okay, what if this guy uh, has an arbitrary number of time of temperature providers depending on some global configuration value, and they are not even stored in a nice little variable that's accessible from outside? So what if switching to the slide? Uh, this is the code for SUT, and somewhere deep inside, inside the logic, inside the for loop, perhaps, it constructs a new time provider or a new temperature provider. And it depends on conditions that are hard to predict. So the previous version constructs a set number of providers and that we can't do And it does it in the constructor. Okay. Right? One. Yeah, so it does it in the constructor, which gives you the opportunity to run the constructor, replace the collaborators then do the work. This one doesn't do that. It just constructs collaborators as needed during some complex computation. So what you do here, you have to intercept that creation of the, um, of the collaborator. So instead of new time provider, you write this code. Remember when we did the factory design pattern? We said whenever you need to intercept and do something interesting, for the construction of an object, use a factory and put that smarts for what to construct inside the factory. So this replaces new time provider service. And with this, here's what we can do. We can construct our time uh, uh, provider and uh, the time provider service, let's say it has the set instance method, we're gonna stick our uh, fake time provider, and fake temperature provider inside these time provider services. And then we just run our SUT. When the SUT runs and it needs uh, an instance of the time provider, it's going to ask the time provider service to get an instance. It's going to give it this instance. This works for the case when you want the same fake time provider to be used in all places where an instance is asked. And that makes sense. For a time provider, probably you should have only one in the whole system. There's no multiple times. For a temperature provider, maybe that's not enough. Depending on that. Is, this, is this clear? Is it? OK, so I'm going to build on top of this example. Um, so this, the rest is uh, as usual. Look at the time. Um, so in the second half of the lecture, I will show you a, a framework that kind of elaborates on this. Um, but before I go there, I want to show you the, um, you know, the ultimate uh, tool, or actually the, the tool of ultimate, uh, of last resort. Sometimes when I work with code that has been, you know, very ugly, uh, it constructs and refers to these collaborators everywhere. Uh, and I, I'm not able to hoist that in a nice place where I can replace them. I uh, go in and write conditionals like this in the production code uh, to essentially do something else in place of the actual production code. Okay, So this is, uh, this is the production code that existed in this uh, legacy piece of code. It just went in and used this time provider to get the time. I don't want it to do it like this. 
and I don't, it doesn't give me a nice way to replace this time provider. So I'm going to write code that says if I'm in, um, if testing use fake time, then I uh, I get my time from from this fake object, perhaps. Otherwise, I do this. Okay. Yes. So you're actually modifying your production code. Yes. Folks for testing. Yeah, that's what I said. This I don't know. Don't use this unless you can do otherwise. Uh, but yes, I do this. And uh, pretty much every big system that I wrote, at some point I have to write this. Because um, there's no other way to kind of uh, get it out. But here's how I try to mitigate this um, danger. So this, you might say, it's a little bit ugly. But why is it ugly? It's ugly because it complicates your production code. It pollutes your production code. It may be hard to understand what goes on. So the way I, I address that is, first, all of these conditionals are very easy to spot. That's why I have a convention. Perhaps I'm starting with testing underscore. Okay? I can search for testing underscore in all my code base find where this is. Second, I always set this conditional such that testing underscore blah is only true when testing not the other way around, because then it becomes hard to read. So whenever I say if testing, I kind of ignore this for if I want to read the production behavior. And uh, third, I try to keep this very small. So it's always a, no, four or five lines like this. Uh, I shouldn't need to have complex code in here that I have to mentally skip to get to my production code. Okay. Um, so you do this when you can't really hoist this out in places where you can any, any questions? Um, probably a better way would have been to take this part of the code, refactor it, to move it to its own method, and then in that method do some sort of other dependency injection uh, if you can. But sometimes the code is really ugly enough that it might not be easy to do so. Uh, so some comments, uh, most of which I have already covered. Uh, yeah. This is not, uh, not the most beautiful code you're going to have, but at least uh, try to have uh, clear and uh, um, consistent conventions. So what I pick, I have this testing underscore, and I choose this. Sometimes these are booleans. Uh, sometimes these are strings or uh, objects for testing. But always, I have the convention that this is false. This test is false if I'm not testing. So it only tests as true if I'm testing. It's a simple thing. It, it seems like a, but uh, if you don't, I'm not uh, careful about this and introduce too many of these, sometimes they'll be, some of them will be true, some of them will be false, hard to, hard to follow. Should we write this as a, like a compiler type? Because if, if statements are executed like infinite times, then it's slow down. Um, good question. Did you hear the question? Should this be a compiler flag to avoid, you know, the cost of that if statement? What would the answer? I guess it depends. On what? It depends on what? On. On. On the amount of usage the code will use. Okay. Good. That's the right answer. Uh, do not optimize prematurely. Optimize when you need to. So um, I generally do not try to be, I, I try to write the clearest code and uh, leave optimizations for later when I do profiling and I measure that it's a problem. Uh, very rarely this is going to be, uh, this is going to be a problem. Um, so. You say that this executes a million times. If you're in a language like uh, C and this compiles to machine code, that's the only place where you may see a cost increase because of a conditional. But a modern hardware will predict that. Uh, the first time it takes it, it remembers it in the prediction table. Once it predicts it to be false, you won't see the cost. You don't cash cost afterwards. Okay? If you're in Python or, uh, or Ruby, it doesn't. I mean, there's other things that are a million times slower than uh, 
than one condition. If you write for high performance code, you know, you may want to. Plus, in a language like Python, you don't really have a, a preprocessor uh, flags to be able to play with. I don't worry so much about that. Um, okay. And uh, next I'll show you a framework that Google invented to actually automate some dependency injection, but we'll take a break first. Um, let me bring up some feedback. Uh, if not, is it's not too late, uh, please. Um, and mini lectures are due today. I know that two teams have uh, not yet expressed preferences. I will try to work on this tomorrow and let you know what your uh, day is and what your topic is. And if, um, if I, I see any problems, uh, oversubscribe this, I'll, I'll get back to you. Maybe get, uh, get other preferences. Any questions about that? No questions? OK, let's move on. So dependency injection is uh, so useful not just for testing, actually, even for structuring code, you will see, that uh, some people have thought of trying to write frameworks that do much of this uh, boilerplate stuff for you. Um, so one that I'm going to be describing is called uh, Ju Juice. Uh, it's written like this. Uh, Google built it, and at least in some parts of Google, uh, internal developers, it's, it's quite a, a fashionable. Now, Juice is written for Java. But uh, Java code would take too much uh, space on my, on my slide, so I kind of Pythonized it. Uh, and most of the concepts will come across, uh, some details are kind of not working quite right in Python, but uh, bear with me. So you'll learn the concept of Juice, but you may have to look up the actual uh, syntax uh, in the actual documentation. So this is how you would program our uh, uh, system using Juice. And this is, again, this is programming your production code uh, in light of dependency injection. So first, somewhere uh, where your application starts in your main entry point, you instantiate, um, you create one of these injectors. Uh, this is a juice data structure, juice object, that essentially it's like a uh, Uber factory, right? It's a factory that can create many instances. And it's kind of built in in Juice. So you, you get this injector, and every time you need to create an object, you use this factory. Inject a create instance, and you tell it an instance of what you want, an instance of time provider. Okay. So every time you construct objects uh, all over your code, you don't ever write new time provider. You write injector, create instance, time provider. So uh, the slogan is that juice is the new new. Uh, right? So you replace all occurrences of new with the occurrences of, uh, of juice. So this starts to look a little bit like our factory uh, trick that we used a couple of slides back. Uh, except that this time, it's a, uh, it's a factory that's smart enough to look at its argument and decide what to build. But it can do, it can do more. This is how you write tests with it. Um, so first, you need to, uh, you have these injector calls, these create instance calls in your production code. You have to configure Juice to tell it that whenever there is a create instance for time provider, uh, give it uh, this fake time provider. Construct a fake time provider instead. Whenever there's a temperature provider required, construct a fake time provider, fake time provider. And same for, uh, for alert. So essentially, the juice injector, somewhere inside it, it has a, a state that keeps track of these bindings uh, and mappings. And it's going to be able to, um, so once, once uh, you call juice install this module, then uh, you can just call your, uh, your system under test. And whenever it's going to need a time provider, it's going to call injector create instance. The injector will look at the currently installed configuration module. It's going to see, oh, time provider. Uh, I'm being asked to create a fake time provider. You no, know, transparently create a fake time provider, and the code will happily work. Uh, okay, and then the rest of the test is uh, is the same. 
I'm not entirely clear why they chose this way to configure, um, because you could have imagined uh, some other form of configuration. But at least one advantage is that the configuration is code. So you could write here conditionals. You could write loops. You could have very flexible configuration that maybe depends on uh, various system parameters uh, to decide what classes to inject in what places. Um, okay, so uh, Juice can do uh, quite a bit more. Imagine that you have a constructor that actually takes a, a, a time provider, a temperature provider, and an alert provider, and maybe the constructor does this. So there's no actual explicit call to the constructor. Uh, but you, if you put this, uh, so something like this you put in Java, this is a juice uh, annotation that tells juice, whenever you need to construct an object of type main, use this constructor. And since the constructor needs these arguments, construct them recursively. So juice can figure out not only what constructor to use, but if the constructor needs arguments, it's going to recursively figure out how to construct some instances of those, those arguments. Okay? So whenever Juice needs a main instance, it will synthesize an implementation for these parameters. Uh, now, in Python, this wouldn't quite work, because if you just write this, Juice doesn't know what is my time supposed to be, an integer, uh, an instance of time provider. But imagine this in Java. This is one place in which Java really comes in uh, in a big way. This is declared to be a time provider, so Juice knows, oh, you need a time provider. I'm going to construct a time provider for you. And if there's a configuration that tells me to construct a fake time provider instead, I'm going to give you a fake time provider. So it does all of this kind of hooking up collaborators to your, uh, uh, um, together uh, for you. So you don't even need to have this uh, you know, real initializer that explicitly constructs, because Juice will do, will do this for you. So one thing to, to realize, juice will actually be used in the production code. While your code runs, it's not going to call a new time provider. It's going to call juice. And juice, by default, if it's not configured otherwise, it will construct time provider for you. Uh, OK? Any, any questions? So uh, Juice is quite smart. It can figure out which constructor to use. Uh, if the constructor has parameters, it can recursively uh, construct instances for those parameters. You can even annotate some fields in an object uh, with, with these Juice annotations. And when Juice instantiates that object, if the field has an annotation, you will construct an instance for that field, or whatever type the field is. So that's called field uh, injection. And you can essentially simulate the setter injection, dependency injection with it. And uh, uh, the, the cool stuff is that this helps not only for testing. This makes essentially all of your modules independent of other modules in your system. Because whatever your module would have needed to refer to some other class, it refers by way of juice. And this will allow you to put together this module with some other instances. So essentially, um, put together your system in different ways at different times by just let, telling Juice how to route these constructors. Is, is that uh, clear? I have a sense that uh, didn't follow me. Let, me. let me try to explain this a little more. So when you write big systems, uh, you, you find yourself with classes that, if you look at the body of this class, you will see mentions. So this is class uh, uh, C1. You'll find here C2, maybe with a new. You'll find here new C3, or a function that takes a parameter of C3. And you have a fairly complex set of dependencies between your classes. It could actually be quite a mess if you haven't designed it carefully. Which means that if I want to take this class and say, oh, I want to reuse this in another project. You move it to another project, you find that, oh, I can't just move it. I have to move this one and this one. 
and it's like you know spaghetti once you pick you know one thread to move over you find that it kind of carries with it you know half of your plate um, if the code wasn't designed for reuse right do you understand this is this clear okay so what what juice does says well don't write new c2 uh, write a juice of c2 and here juice of c3 so these classes now your code does not depend directly on c2 and c3 it depends on juice i can take this class here i can try to run it and juice will say well no you have to tell me whenever the code needs a c2 what should i plug instead and you say oh plug my uh Plug my other instance, maybe, uh, of stuff that does C2. So, new C2. Or not new C2. Uh, let's call it uh, C2 prize. Okay? So this way, you can take this module, put it in another project, and tell it, without modifying it, tell it to use different instances of the classes that it needs. This is very useful. And this is why uh, so many people in Google really uh, try to program this way because they can reuse code a lot more easily uh, without having to hoist with them everything else. Now, but that by itself, that by itself is not quite enough. So the way you have to write the code to take full advantage of this, uh, of this reuse is to essentially uh, use interfaces and to, to now, to demonstrate uh, this, this problem, imagine that you have this main that depends on time provider, okay? But you want to sometimes use a fake time provider. So what you need to do is to break this dependency chain by using interfaces. So pick some strategic places in your code where you have dependencies between modules and inject there an interface, you know, like a Java interface. Uh, an interface just lists the methods that you need, but it doesn't tell you what the implementation of these methods is. So main is essentially written in terms of these interfaces, iTime provider, iTemp provider, and you, know, the, you just list the methods, and time provider is an implementation of the interface. If you have a code structure like this, it's very easy for juice or even manual dependency injection, to construct a fake time provider that is an instance of the iTime provider. And main will happily use a fake time provider because it does not specifically say uh, time provider. It just says I uh, time provider. Okay? So essentially the lesson here is that if you want to use inject uh, dependency injection uh, effectively, uh, you have to think of the places where you will need it and uh, make your dependencies on interfaces. Depend on interfaces, don't depend on implementation. This way, I can hoist this main code out and uh, use it in another project with some other time provider, some other temperature provider, and it'll work just fine. Any, any questions? Um, Okay, so use the interfaces, uh, decouple the dependencies, um, but don't do this. Uh, I've seen people who program, uh, who take this you know, to heart really too much, and they have interfaces all over the place, and it's kind of hard to, to trace, uh, trace their code. So use it judiciously. Use it where, uh, where you think it's really going to help, where you really are going to use a dependency injection. Um, so try this out in, in some places in your code and see, see how it works. So, so far, um, we have looked at how to write uh, test doubles, test stubs, uh, test marks, uh, test phase. This was in the last lecture. And today, uh, various ways to design your code or to use techniques like dependency injection to be able to easily replace your uh, collaborators uh, with, with fakes. So next, I want to uh, kind of wrap up this uh, designing for testing, for testability with uh, essentially creating even more opportunities uh, for doubles. And this is really inspired by one of the books that I listed on, on, the, on the title slide, uh, Working with Legacy Code. You have this big pile of code, and you want to refactor or make changes to a piece of it, probably before 
it, you should kind of refactor the way that this interacts with your code, essentially to create scenes, interfaces, uh, where you can inject dependencies. Uh, some architectures uh, are already naturally uh, like this. They have very clear interfaces from the design of the architecture. So for example, the client-server architecture. There's a client and a server, and the, the interaction between them is a very uh, clear scene in your system. And uh, it makes sense, for example, to write a fake web client to impersonate the client, uh, to test your real backend. And this is what we did in warm-up one. We gave you the fake uh, client using just curl commands to make the HTTP requests, and you wrote the backend. And then, uh, then to test the client, you write the fake back backend. Okay? Uh, it's much simpler than the real backend, and uh, the testing of the client can be done against the fake uh, backend. What we do at Conviva when we have these themes, uh, essentially the the client team writes two versions of the client, the real client and the fake client. Okay? The fake client is a very lightweight, very easy to understand, it's very configurable, you can, you can tell it uh, to simulate different scenarios, different workloads, it's used for scale testing, we fire up a million of them, uh, they're very small, and uh, the backend team uses the fake client to, uh, to test their, um, their backend. The, the backend team Writes two versions of the backend. The real backend, which is scalable, it's uh, uh, you know, distributed, redundant, fault tolerant, and then writes a simple one that it gives to the client team to test their client. It runs on one machine, on your laptop, very little load, very easy to understand what goes on. A lot of logging, a lot of debugging support. Okay? So um, this is a way in which we exploit this uh, client server um, scene. Uh, the model view controller is another architecture that it's by design factored to have these themes. So you can essentially, uh, you know, interface. I mean, change the view. You have a very complicated uh, a GUI, but you can have a very simple view that's programmatic uh, that can be used to test uh, the rest of the code. Okay. Same for the database. Uh, because the model is so separated, you can plug in a different model. Uh, that doesn't use a database. So everything runs a lot faster. Wouldn't be good for your production setting, but it's just fine for testing. Okay? So this is, in fact, one thing that you are getting from these architectures. They're not just good at uh, organizing your code for production. They're good also for, they kind of impose a testable uh, architecture to start with. So I want to spend the uh, remaining uh, five or six minutes of the lecture showing you how you can uh, organize your code to make more testable, for example, when you're using third-party libraries. Because that's another natural theme. Uh, imagine that in your application you've decided to use Dropbox um, to store files and, and retrieve files. Okay? And so you're going to be having all sorts of things like this in your code. Uh, in some place in your code, you're going to uh, have this URL open, which is a library function that open, makes a GET request and you type in here the Dropbox uh, API, and this gives you the myfile.txt in the files directory at Dropbox. And if you look up on the web, Dropbox publishes their uh, REST API for how you can actually use this. And if the response status is 200, you know that response.data contains the contents of your file. Name. And everywhere you need to use a file, read a file, you have this kind of code. Um, to write the file, you have to use a POST request, which uh, there's a different a version of URL open that takes two parameters, the URL and an actual new content. And if the response status code is 200, it means the file was successfully uh, written. The problem with this uh, code is uh, this is actually very hard to test. Because you probably have to get the Dropbox account. Um, it has to probably be different than the one you'll be using for production, because you're going to be messing up all sorts of stuff. Uh, it's probably slow. You have, um, you, know, you have to be connected to the internet to test it. And it's actually hard to simulate all sorts of scenarios that you want your code to handle. For example, you want your code to handle Quora uh, exhaust, uh, exhaust uh, Quora exhausted, uh, when your Dropbox uh, account is full. It's very hard. You're not going to write a test that fills up your Dropbox account just to get to that scenario. So um, first thing that I would do is I would wrap uh, 
this Dropbox API, I would write my own class, Dropbox API, that packages all of these details of how you access Dropbox. So for example, um, it, would, it would expose a read method with a file name and a write method with a file name. And it will take care internally of, uh, of reading and writing, and it will return perhaps one of these uh, HTTP responses such that the code is pretty much the same otherwise. If you do this, you get not only you clear all this clutter in your code, but you get more testability. Because, um, because I can write, in addition to my regular Dropbox API, I can write a fake Dropbox API, which stores in memory a list of files. So read can be implemented by looking up this file into this dictionary, and if you find it, then you make this fake URL response with status close to 100 and the contents of the file. And writing simply, this is writing of a file. Imagine how fast this is going to be. You don't need uh, authentication. You know, don't need an account. Um, you can easily simulate files missing and even uh, other sorts of errors. But if you do it like this, you still need this fake URL response, which constructs something that looks like a URL response so that you can, uh, it works with your code. Okay, so this is the first step I would do. And I actually, I do this all the time. When I write systems that require external service access, I write this kind of API to my external service, and I write a fake one. And I do all my, most of my tests I do with fake, one or two tests with a real service, just to make sure I actually um, I do the right thing. Um, but if you go down this path, pretty soon you'll realize, well, you don't even have to have this uh, read method returns an URL uh, response, because that's already exposing some concrete implementation of the real Dropbox API. Um, I'm going to make a much nicer API that returns the contents of the file or throws an exception when something happens. Okay? So this is an even higher level abstraction. It completely uh, abstracts all the HTTP transport uh, details. And I'm using exception for errors as opposed to status codes, which is uh, friendlier to your programming language. Uh, this is actually, once you've done this, you realize not only is this easier code to write because you're hiding all of the HTTP mess, but now you're completely independent of Dropbox. Now you can plug in here uh, another, uh, another service that stores files. So one could be your fake in-memory service for testing, but now you can use you know, maybe Google Drive API. And, uh, and maybe then you'll change this name Dropbox to some... Uh, uh, no, network storage or cloud storage uh, API. And you'll discover that you were driven by testability, but you ended up with better code, code that's actually uh, cleaner uh, and easier to use, easier to port with other, uh, other services. Okay? And so this could be the fake Dropbox uh, uh, high-level API implementation for testing. Um, okay. And uh, unfortunately, I do not have real time. Uh, I, I, I just let me just spend two minutes on this. So the last uh, four slides, or three slides in my presentation, are about another very hard to test scenario where you have uh, multi-threaded code. So this is a worker thread. It instantiates a, a thread, and when it runs, it listens on a socket for work. And when it gets work, it does some work and maybe puts the results in a, in a database. This is a common thing that you sometimes need to write, but it's very hard uh, to test. Because from outside, you have to create this socket, these threads. The way it's written, uh, you send the work and you have no easy way to tell that the work has been done already. Okay? So you write tests like this. This is how you test it. You create a worker, but this is a separate thread, which is a problem. You have to make sure you kill it uh, before the test is done create the socket, you connect, you send. You don't know when the work is done, so to be safe, you sleep for two, two seconds. And um, I've written tests like this uh, in the old days, uh, quite a bit. And uh, it's good because it tests the actual socket uh, interaction, so you just screwed up your socket code, you'll catch it. But um, this asynchronous, asynchrony is actually quite ugly. This time.sleep, uh, 
Sometimes you have to increase this just to be safe, make sure the test doesn't fail. And these uh, add up pretty quickly. You have a test suite of a thousand tests, it starts, uh, you have to run it overnight, uh, pretty much. Okay, so um, this is what I propose, and this is what I do nowadays. Again, the humble method uh, uh, refactoring. This is my actual code that does the threading, the socket, uh, reading. However, I factor out the actual work. The actual work is factoring here, and hopefully this is most of the complexity. But this is code that I'm going to test synchronously. Because you can just call this function, pass it a, uh, an argument, and test that it works properly in all of the cases without having to go to threads, to sockets. Okay? If you, um, so has the most of the complexity, and uh, has no communication, and this is the humble method. Little, uh, has very rich interaction, very poor in complexity, uh, hard to test, but not worth testing. Okay? That's the definition of humble method. And uh, this, is how, uh, this is how you test it. It's a very simple kind of uh, unit test. It doesn't depend on anything. It's synchronously, as, long, as soon as the work is done, this returns, so you can make your assert, and uh, everything is, is great. And uh, I typically still write one test with the actual thread, with actually waiting for two seconds, with actually, because that's my integration test, to make sure that I'm using the threads properly. But I'm not going to test all of the intricacies and the corner cases of my worker through that expensive uh, interface. Okay? So this pretty much uh, uh, completes my uh, set of lectures on testing. This, um, it's, uh, it's very important to think about testing when you write your code. You're going to end up with cleaner design, more testable design. The opposite is also true. If you don't think about testing when you write your code, uh, you're going to end up with code that's not testable uh, or very hard to test. Okay? So write your tests along, along with your code. So uh, thank you. And uh,